Hello. Uh, this is my first Yapsi too in the city. <laughs> so. But uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting city. I, I'd like to talk about stuff I learned. First of all, I, I'd like to talk about stuff I learned this week. Uh, now, uh, one of the things I learned that, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, Kiev is kind of a, a dangerous, scary city. Uh, now, I don't mean the usual senses uh, here. I never mean anything in the usual senses. But, you know, like, there's all this graffiti that undoubtedly says, uh, you know, go home Yankee imperialist. Uh, I mean, more, more, more mundane dangers. I mean, uh, how many of you have noticed uh, that, you know, you have to be just a little more careful where you put your feet down in this city than in some other cities? Uh, they have these lovely rain gutters, which I'm sure are, are great at uh, um, sending the rain away. But uh, there are some more obvious hazards right in the middle of the sidewalk. Uh, some less obvious hazards. Uh, and, you know, the usual things you have to just walk around. You know, you have to walk up and down steps and up and down hills, and you have to walk around the fountains, or, or through them if that's your thing. But, uh, but you know, everywhere you walk, there, you have to watch. Uh, you know, if, if you are in uh, deep conversation with the person next to you, uh, you're going to get got by one of these things. Uh, or you fall into a, a manhole cover, which is not quite level with the rest of the street. <laughs> Or you'll run into one of these torture devices. <laughs> uh, not all of the rain gutters are very well constructed. Uh, you know, if it sticks up two inches above the, the ground, no big deal. If, it stick, if it's two inches below ground, no big deal. If anybody here is from Kiev, uh, please don't take offense. <laughs> I, I, I make fun of uh, most of the cities I visit. So you're not special that way. Um, you know, of course, if you have a, a beautiful bunch of flowers, that justifies putting something out there. Um, uh, and um, this, this is uh, the standing up version. I almost, they also lay down, and I almost killed myself on one of the flat ones. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get a picture of it. Um, the steps, uh, lintels up and down are a little confusing sometimes. Uh, you usually have to step up before you go downstairs. <laughs> I think the idea is to trip you up at the top of the stairs and, and get you going early. I mean, it's a fairly short set of stairs. Um, you know, just have to... That one's very solid, by the way. It doesn't move at all. <laughs> you know, and when you're coming home from uh, the, the, uh, the parties and you've had one, one beer, Things start getting a little out of focus, you know, so you have to look a little harder, and then they get more out of focus. Um, after two beers, it starts looking like this. Uh, you know, the manhole covers start looking animate. Uh, and after three beers, you start imagining things that aren't even there. So. Uh, but, you know, I'm from California, and I worry about earthquakes. So, you know, I, I, it, it's well-intentioned to put these screens up there, up above, that will catch all of the cornices falling down from above. But, you know, these griffins, if that's what they are, they're pretty well-endowed for griffins. Um, they, they could also fall off and, and uh, kill you in an earthquake. Uh, you know, there, there's all sorts of weird stuff that could fall off the buildings at you. Uh, I mean, it keeps, it keeps on going. Uh, uh, you know, this, this building, you know, has to have two young ladies holding it up or it would fall down on your head. And they're so scared they were petrified, I guess. That is not the last pun. <laughs> In indoors is no safer. I mean, there's stuff that can fall on your heads. I guess that's why they build all the furniture fairly heavy here. You know, and then there's gravitational anomalies. You have to be careful for. Uh, you know, things just aren't, aren't quite straight up and down everywhere you expect them to be. 
And then there's the, the rips in reality that, that go on to another, go into another universe entirely. Um, that's just right up here on top of the hill here, by the way, if you want to uh, see it for yourself. Now, uh, up at uh, St. Sophia, uh, there's these, these doors um, on the cell block. I guess the cell block is what they call it. Uh, but, I, you know, I saw this bench between these two doors and I said, boy, I would not sit on that bench for anything. Those doors are too scary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't, don't put your, don't leave your children out in front of this building. <laughs> I, I, I think this building thinks that children are edible. Uh, and for the, you know, older teens, there, there's this haunted palace. Um, but they'll actually never make it there because you'll notice uh, down there at the bottom, there is a wear pigeon that will uh, uh, prevent you from uh, surviving that long. Uh, some of the buildings here uh, specialize in blinding you uh, if you get the angle of the sun just right. Some of you, some of them blind you in other ways. I mean, there's more than one way to do it. Uh, by the way, that's uh, that's Kiev University, by the way. <laughs> some of it. Even, the, even the, uh, the monuments get into the act. Uh, we have all sorts of interesting architecture that, that will kind of eat your mind. You know, there's the, uh, the opiate of the masses and the, the opiate of the bureaucrats. And uh, in, in this case, uh, the postmodern building is uh, apparently the opiate of these two extraterrestrials that are on the right here. I, I tried talking to the nearer one here just before, this is, this is what he looked like just before he sucked my brain dry. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're building these strange apparatus. They try to hide it. You know, if you walk up on the hill, it's, it's just trees. You know, you kind of see the stadium up there. You kind of see out through the trees, but they, they try to hide it. But there's this apparatus, which is obviously an antenna for communicating with aliens uh, somehow. Um, and these, these weird fungal growths grow on, you know, kind of strange mushrooms uh, are on the roofs uh, in patches. Uh, there's, there's black fungus that, uh, you know, is creeping up from the plaza here. Uh, this building is very dangerous because it's made out of chocolate. Um, and you shouldn't eat, eat that whole building. Um, that would be bad for you. Actually, it, the, the, the guidebook actually said it was made out of chocolate, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and, and if, that, if that weren't enough, they have the, you know, if it wasn't enough that, that they put all these weird things in the street to block your path, they have these huge cranes which move buildings uh, from time to time so you can't find them. You know, the, the, the ancient art is very strange. Um, in Mercy, I'll skip over the, the modern art, uh, uh, which around here, I guess, is, is called Soviet. Uh, and then there's the, the, the contemporary art, uh, which is also scary. Uh, and the, the very recent art. In fact, this was installed while we were here. Now, you might think this is not scary at all, I might think it's just weird, but you know, at the other end of that, that plaza is this dead one of those. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure whether the one shoot killed off the first one or not. Um, you know, and of course there's the, the, the dangerous tourists <laughs> and uh, the dangerous, beautiful Ukrainian women. That's my wife, if you didn't know. Uh, and the, uh, the dangerous babushkas underneath uh, dangerous gazebos. Uh, but of course, the, the, by far the most dangerous things are the ghosts of Perl programmers. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's uh, stuff I learned in the last few days. Uh, I, I also learned a bunch of stuff over the last year. Uh, so, now I'd like to talk about um, some of those strange things I learned.
Uh, and for some reason, most of the things I've learned can be expressed as inequalities. Uh, we passed an interesting milestone uh, this year in February. There's this website called Rosetta Code that I've talked about before. Uh, it shows solutions for various tasks in various languages so that you can compare the solutions uh, in those languages. Uh, let me show you the page listing of Perl 6 solutions to uh, various tasks here. Uh, okay. Uh, well, there's, there's the Perl page. There's the, the Perl 6 page. So, you know, you can, you can go down and find various uh, uh, interesting pages. The one I'd like to show you today down here is uh, called uh, Rosetta Code Rank Languages by Popularity. And the, uh, the page looks like this, but you can, you can go down to uh, different language solutions. So if you go to Perl, it's uh, actually fairly short. It's shorter, it's shorter than the, uh, the Perl 6 solution in this case because uh, Perl 5 cheats and uses a CPAN. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the, the, the Perl 6 solution is currently just web scraping. But, uh, you know, it says languages ranked by popularity. Uh, it's not really about popularity, really. It's really about which language advocates are the most obsessive about putting examples on Rosetta code. Um, anyway, you can see here in February, this was as of uh, 2013 to 16. Uh, at this, on this date, uh, we took a snapshot, and Perl 6 and Perl 5 were actually tied at that point. Uh, that is the point at which uh, Perl 6 uh, uh, became more obsessive than uh, Perl 5 about this. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, later in, in April, the snapshot on the whole thing here, Perl 6 is now up to 576, having passed uh, Mathematica and Ada. Now we can actually run this this program to, to download that, and if we if we do, um, and, yeah. Yeah. what we get is uh, this is the results as, as of last night. You see, the Perl six is up in seventh place, uh, having also passed. Uh, Go, Ruby, and D. Uh, and uh, so I have Pico Lisp and J and C and Python and Racket. Cool. Okay. Um, but one of the things I, I learned last year is that there are people who are crazier than me. There's this language you see up here called Racket. Uh, it's a variant of Scheme. Uh, in April, the Racket language was not even listed in the top 40. But now it has whizzed past everyone else except for Tickle. Um, so, so uh, obviously, you know, Perl, Perl is high in the rankings because it's a, a good language, but those racket folks are just bunkers. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we can have double standards too. Uh, but February and April turned out to be rather uh, interesting, uh, not to say traumatic for me, for other reasons as well. Uh, primarily having to do with uh, coming down with a slight case of cancer. Uh, but in order to go into that, uh, I, I need to talk more about inequalities. And in order to talk about inequalities, I have to talk a little bit about numbers. You know, mathematicians are, are strange. They, they think numbers are kind of sexy. Of course, bacteria think math is kind of sexy too. After all, bacteria know how to multiply by dividing and thus add to their numbers. But so do cancer cells, come to think of it. Uh, mathematicians seem to, to like those numbers, but mathematicians are also lazy, kind of like uh, Perl programmers. So instead of writing uh, something like this, they love to factor out the redundancy and write things like this. So one of the cool things we put into Perl 6, and that we could probably backport to Perl 5, is the ability to test ranges without repeating the variable name. It, would, it looks like this in, in Perl 6. Um, oh yeah, you get to leave out the friends too, but that's not the point here. Uh, mostly I just want to run this snippet for you. And my main point is to ask you which VM do you want to run it on? 
right? .NET, JVM. Um, sorry, I can't offer you uh, more VM yet. Uh, uh, not for another month or two, but uh, Matthew's working on that. So let, let's try it on the JVM here. Now, the problem with the JPM is it has to think a long time <laughs> before it gets going. But eventually it goes. And it's, it's pretty speedy once it gets going. Uh, now, Perl 6 has, has constants too, but you notice that my age is not one of them. In fact, my age seems to get auto-incremented uh, periodically. Uh, so it, it, it works more like this. Um, so let's let's fix that. Uh, okay, that's a while age plus plus. Or you know, if if you believe in the afterlife, you can just put this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Unhandled exception stuff. I guess, I guess that's what happens in the afterlife. <laughs> well, that's what my computer thinks anyway. No, that's what the JVM thinks. Uh, okay. Well, you see here that the variable is, is incremented only once, which is the, the uh, which is the, the, the point. It's incremented only once, despite the fact that the, the value is used twice, once in each comparison. Uh, this might not seem like a big advantage here, but suppose the side effect happened down in the subroutine, or the, the, that was in the middle, or it was very expensive. Uh, having that automatically uh, duplicate the value for you is very handy. Uh, it's just one of those little, little things that we, we threw in. It's not a big feature. But it's... Um, but if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that I'm, I'm planning to live to 100, 120. Uh, so in, in, in two years, I'll be due for my midlife crisis. Well, actually 1.1 years, really, because uh, my birthday is next month. Uh, of course, I've been in one crisis or another all my life, so I rather suspect that my midlife crisis will be indistinguishable from the rest of my life in that regard this year. Uh, as I mentioned, my crisis was prostate cancer. Uh, not sure that counts as the right kind of crisis uh, compared with midlife. Maybe it is. You either survive midlife or you don't, I guess. Anyway, I'm 58, going on 59. Uh, starting to slow down a little bit already. Getting a little forgetful. You know, what was it they said about the bear? Or was it about the dog? Maybe it was an elephant. Maybe they said it about me. It doesn't really matter. Uh, anyway, what, here's what they said about the bear, if it was a bear, or even, even if it wasn't. Um, the amazing thing is not that it dances well, but that it dances at all. I, I think Mark Twain said that, unless it was Albert Einstein or, or maybe Ben Franklin. Anyone want to vote for Abe Lincoln? Will Rogers? Groucho Marx? Karl Marx? <laughs> it, it was certainly one of those dead white male guys, the ones that don't dance so well anymore than own selves. Uh, I, I still dance better than any of them. Uh, but of course, the bar is really low on that one. Uh, most of those guys would be older than 120 by now. But you know, we all love comparisons, especially if we get to pick who we get to pick who we compare ourselves to. And you notice how when people want to justify their actions, they always say silly things like, "Well, at least I'm not a murderer." 
It's a really high bar you set yourself there for life. Maybe that's why they give lawyers a bar exam. Mm. I'm sorry, I, I guess, you know, so they, they can go waltzing with bars. I guess I shouldn't make fun of funny American accents, should I, since by definition all Americans have a funny accent. Uh, anyway, where was I? Uh, so I, I, I thought I'd talk about inequality today. Inequality is, has been in the news more than usual lately, especially in the U.S. Now in the United States, we all believe, or we all want to believe, that everyone is created equal. Or if we don't want to believe it, at least we want everyone else to believe that we believe it. Um, but it was not always so in the U.S. I really enjoyed uh, watching the movie about Abraham Lincoln that came out recently. Uh, it's fascinating to look at how close my, my country came to not freeing the slaves during the Civil War. It was kind of a turning point when my, my country started taking this um, all men are created equal thing seriously. Now I do believe that, that equality before the law is a very good thing, as, as the, that movie points out. I also believe that each of us should strive to overcome the stereotypes that our brains have hardwired in to automatically distrust people who are different from us. Be careful, Vladimir, there are some PHP programmers wandering around our neighborhood. <laughs> but really, we need, we need to learn to treat all programmers equally, even those who speak a different language. That being said, it's also very obvious that people are not created equal in every respect, nor do we even stay equal to our own selves as we age. I know this. I'm stupider than my younger self, except in the ways that I'm smarter instead. And some people are skinnier, some people are fatter, some are taller, some are shorter. Northern Europeans with their pale skin are much better at getting skin cancer than people with more pigment in their skin. They're also much better at producing their own vitamin D. You know, it's all trade-offs with, with, uh, with various resulting inequalities. Some people are good programmers, while other people are not so good. Some people have multiple talents, while other people don't seem to excel at much of anything except eating and sleeping. Treating people equally is actually kind of a theological concept. As the Apostle Paul once said, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ. Now the basic idea was simply that we should all treat each other equally because we all suck compared to the standard of perfection. <laughs> you, know, you know I like Jesus, but I also like Darwin. And he tells us a different part of the story about inequality and about competition. And we all kind of suck in Darwin's world too, but uh, comparative suckiness is an important concept. Uh, or more accurately, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've, you've probably uh, heard it already, but I'd like to remind you about the story of the angry bear unless it was the dog, or the elephant, or maybe a lion, or maybe it was the lady or the tiger, uh, doesn't matter. Whatever this bear-like entity is, uh, let's call them Fred and George stumble over it in a cave, and it gets really, really angry, or maybe just hungry, or I guess it could be both, no need to be exclusive. Anyway, now they are running for their lives from this bear-like entity. Uh, Fred says, how fast do we need to run to get away from this bear-like entity? And George replies, I don't know. I just know I need to run faster than you. So, you know, there's a comparison again. And this works for computer languages as well. Sometimes for a computer language to succeed, it just has to be better than COBOL. Um, I'm thinking of Java here. And PHP succeeds because it's better than... Um, um, <laughs> HTML. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, just as there's no single IQ scale that you can measure humans with, uh, there's no single fitness function that you can measure computer languages with. In fact, all computer languages are still sucky. They're just differently sucky. That doesn't stop us from all picking our favorite suckiness metric and trying to show that one language is better than another, of course. We like doing that. And we all love to compare winners and losers and figure out why the winners are winning and why the losers are losing. And then we especially love to tell everyone else why 
uh, so that they'll think we're smarter than they are. Of course, human nature is funny. It's, it's not that we're always in favor of the winners. Sometimes we cheer for the winners, and sometimes we cheer for the, the underdog, uh, the person who looks like they're going to lose. On the one hand, we like to see those sudden bursts of skill that carry the day. We also like to see that, that kind of dogged persistence that might someday lead to winning. We hope. Yay, home team. <laughs> The game of programming language design is just the same. It's a game that requires both occasional brilliance and long-term persistence. Sometimes we can pick winners and losers, but programming language design is more like a long race away from a bear-like entity that wants to gobble down the suckiest language. Most of us language designers have managed not to get ourselves eaten yet. We're all still in the state of running away from those lions and tigers and bears, oh my. That's the reality but most language designers don't actually think that way. We all think we're just following some kind of yellow brick road toward the city where wizards will be happy. The big trouble with the yellow brick road is that there's more than one of it. There are lots of the yellow brick roads, so we have to pick which ones to follow and which ones to ignore. Somehow we get back to that comparison thing again. We have to compare yellow brick roads to figure out which ones are worth taking and which not. That one's also right out of the Bible. There's a verse somewhere Jesus says, Why does the yellow brick road that leads to destruction, and many that choose it? Narrow is the yellow brick road that leads to salvation, and few find it. Or where it says, Blessed is he who hears these things and computes the correct fitness function. <laughs> I'm not quite sure which gospel that's from offhand. Um, in computers, we often compare things with numbers. So a language designer has to think a lot about numbers. We have to compare how computers think about numbers with how people think about numbers. Who does it better? Well, it depends on how, how you define your fitness versus suckiness function. You can argue it both ways. In general, people think about numbers better, but computers think about numbers faster. Sort of a quality versus quantity thing. Unfortunately, most computer languages try to force you to think more like the computer. One of the best things about Perl is that it tries to turn that around and, and make the computer think more like people do. So we've continued this tradition in Perl 6 by making numbers more like normal people expect them to be. Normal people numbers don't stop at 2 to the 32nd or 2 to the 64th. They're arbitrary precision. Uh, so that's now the default in Perl 6. Um, so let me show you. Um, on .NET this time, so we, we don't have to uh, wait for Java. Uh, let's take. Ah, uh, I'm gonna go for a broke here. Yep, that's. <laughs> yeah, that that's a real big number, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you you don't have to pull in big number or anything like that. The default is normal human numbers which don't stop at powers of two. Uh, in the same way, you know, people, um, people, at least normal people, don't think of fractions uh, as inexact. Uh, they, they think of them as exact, even when, by divi when you're dividing by something that's not a power of two. So Perl 6 defaults to using rational arithmetic in, uh, rather than floating points. Uh, let's show that like this. <laughs> 76, though, that's, that's a new one. Oh, for the spirit, the spirit of seven. Uh, uh, now, this one, is, this one is specifically written to work under both Perl 5 and Perl 6. Hope I could read my own writing. I never thought I could do. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to type in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, actually, you know, 
What happens if you run that in Perl 5? Well, in the first place, it'll fail because I didn't put the example. <laughs> but um, you have to uh, be aggressive with Perl 5 to get the new things. Now, you notice it doesn't actually terminate. And this is such a well-known problem. It's called the, the floating point bug because one-tenth does not go evenly into uh, that. But suppose uh, we go ahead and run this with Perl 6. Uh, and new stuff is the default in Perl 6 for some reason. You notice it stops actually on 10 because it's using rational arithmetic. Um, also, since Perl supports uh, gradual typing, um, we can uh, be specific about the fact that we're using rationals there. Uh, we're all animal lovers, so we call our rational numbers rats. Uh, all, animal, all animals are, are created unequal, but some are less unequal than others, I guess. In this case, it's the rats that are less unequal rather than the pigs. Uh, we can also explicitly do it in floating point, and in case we'll get the... Uh, uh, <laughs> in, in which case it would have the same bug as in, in Perl 5. Uh, in Perl 6, um, we also added complex numbers, which are so unequal that inequality is the only way you can compare them. You can't ask if one complex number is larger than the other. Uh, if you try to do that, um, It uh, gives you a little polite message. One plus, yeah, I can't type sideways. Plus, uh, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. It says, Complex numbers are not arithmetically ordered. <laughs> Dummy. Uh, oh, no, it doesn't say that. But I guess we took that out. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been thinking a lot about numbers lately. After they found a lump in my prostate early this year, they did a biopsy and uh, discovered that I had prostate cancer. Now, those of you know who, who, who have done the, the cancer thing know that doctors like to use numbers to explain what they know, and especially what they don't know. So, um, in my case, my biopsy gave me a rating of three plus four, which means that the uh, that most of the cancer cancer they found is medium bad, but some of it is worse than that. Uh, my doctor says things to me like, "If both numbers are three, I can cure it 90% of the time with surgery. If both numbers are four, I can cure it 50% of the time." He also says he's done a thousand of these operations, so he should know. I have to admit to him that he's done a few more of these surgeries than I am yet another inequality. So I went home with some books he lent me and figured out from the books that given the biopsy results, I had about a 40% chance that it had spread to the other side of my prostate and about a 14% chance that there was uh, an extra, extra prostatic extension, I can't even say it, and about a 2% chance that it had spread further than that, which more or less comes out to, we'll know a lot more when we take it out. What we know now is, is much less than what we will know. Well, that's not right, is it? That always looks wrong. It should be like that. Yeah. I love Unicode. <laughs> much better. Um, back to my story. I, I really didn't know what to think after this. So, like any rational person, I just chalked up my chances of 50-50 and scheduled surgery. Uh, and so I had my prostate removed um, earlier this year. I will spare you the uh, details, except for some other uh, interesting numbers. The surgeon did not actually do the surgery on me. Uh, he, all, he has only two arms, and that turns out it isn't enough. Uh, instead, I was operated on by a robot with five arms. So, you know, I had to ask. Uh, the robot's name was Clyde. They said Bonnie was over in the corner. I think it was the workstation the doctor used to control the robot, but I was already strapped down and I couldn't see it. Her. Whatever. 
whoever. Now, I, I don't know if that's why, why the robot got its name, but you know, the original Bonnie and Clyde put a lot of holes in other people. Uh, so, some more numbers. Uh, humans are supposed to be objects of genus three. That's what a, a topologist would say. A coffee cup and a donut uh, are both genus one because they have one hole that goes all the way through to the other side. To a topologist, there's no hole in the top of the coffee cup, just a sort of depression. You might say topologists just aren't happy when they have a depression. Uh, a coffee cup makes the topologist happy because of the handle. So a sugar bowl with two handles makes a topologist twice as happy as a coffee cup does. Well, that's what they say, but maybe they're just using coffee and sugar as antidepressants. Human beings, at least those with intact eardrums, are supposed to have three topological holes, hence genus three. Uh, no, I'm not going to describe the holes for you. Uh, I just want to brag about the fact that thanks to Clyde the robot, I was all the way up to a genus eight object, and that broke my previous record of five. In other words, I had a lot of holes in me. Uh, you might even say I was holier than now. <laughs> Though perhaps not as holy as Bonnie and Clyde ended up eventually. Anyway, after the surgery, Gloria and I were kind of hoping for a straight thumbs up or thumbs down from the results. But the news from the pathologist was, again, kind of mixed. Some of the cancer uh, was more aggressive than they thought, so my new rating was 3 plus 4 plus 5. Um, and, you know, 5 is the, the worst end of it. And the tumor had, in fact, spread to the other side of the prostate and also had started trying to find a way out. That's that extra prostatic extension thing again I was only supposed to have a 14% chance of. Well, that, you know, that turned into a 100% chance. Uh, so that was the bad news. On the good side, it looks like they think they got it all anyway. The lymph nodes were all clear, the surgical margins were all clear. The one of them was clear only by 0 0.1 millimeter. That's a scary number. Though I suppose you can actually fit a lot of good cells into 0 0.1 millimeter. On the bad side, uh, if cancer metastasizes, it can bypass all that nearby stuff and go anywhere in your body. Now, I'd already hit that 14% jackpot, so next thing to worry about is the 2% the jackpot. But I don't have to worry about that very hard because the other bit of good news is that they have a really good test to see if there are any tumors they didn't get. Since prostate-specific antigen is made only by the prostate, that's what prostate-specific means, duh, and I don't have one of those anymore, the PSA readings should, in theory, go all the way down to zero, if all is well. So, in this case, zero is a good number to get on a test. The bad news is, the doc my doctor told me, is that it takes three months for the PSA level to drop to zero. So I had to wait till last month to have it tested. And when I got the results back, it, I got a slight scare, because it didn't exactly say zero. It said less than 0.1. But, you know, it's that, again, that less than sign is the important bit. Uh, that's, uh, that means the lab couldn't measure less than that, so the number is indistinguishable uh, from zero. Uh, in fact, my doctor then congratulated me on my zero reading, so he read it as a zero, uh, or at least wanted me to read it as a zero. So, uh, of course, a few recently metastasized cells aren't going to put out a strong enough signal to measure. Uh, so I can't quite call myself cured yet. Uh, I have to get retested every few months for the next five years and keep that reading at zero, or at least below 0 0.10. If I can do that for five years, it almost certainly is zero. So, objectively, I'm a little less likely to die of cancer than I was a year ago. But you, you realize that makes it objectively more likely that I'll get run over by a bus. <laughs> But you know, psychology is a funny thing. Even though the various tests add up to good news, in my mind now, it's kind of back to that 50-50 proposition. It's either going to get me or it isn't. So, you know, I was stressing a little bit about that. I called up my daughter, Heidi, who is a uh, sort, of, uh, sort of the philosopher of the family. Um, you know, she has a son named Julian, which makes Julian my grandson, one of my grandsons. And some of you know that Julian recently completed three years of treatment for leukemia and he's doing very well so far. It's quite likely that he is cured. Yay. Though, of course, he has to wait his five years, too. <laughs> anyway, Heidi has thought deeply about all those cancery numbery things, you can bet. 
So I told her my news. And I mentioned that even though the doctor thought my odds were now really good, in my mind, I still had my odds pegged at 50-50. There was a pause, and then Heidi said, no, Dad, it's not really 50-50. It's either 100-0 or it's 0-100. You just don't happen to know which of those it is yet. Oh, yeah, I guess. Leave it to your kids to teach you the finer points of Bayesian statistics. Well, leave it to my kids anyway. Anyway, at this point, it looks like you can cheer for me because I'm winning, not because I'm the underdog. So, who is winning, Pearl 5 or Pearl 6? I think you maybe can guess my answer by now. Neither is winning. They are just differently sucky. Just because 6 is larger than 5 doesn't mean you can generalize that to every dimension in which the two languages differ. For instance, in the number of virtual machines currently targeted, Pearl 6 has a slight edge, roughly a 5 to 1 lead, give or take. On the other hand, in terms of speed, depending on the problem, Pearl 5 has a slight edge. Um, at least Pearl 5 has a slight, has a, uh, uh, is very uh, fast compared to Pearl 6 so far. Smart people are working on fixing that. Uh, not, not, not by slowing down Pearl 5. <laughs> well, they, they do that too. But. Uh, so, to, to my mind, really, uh, coming from a, you know, a, a Pearl 6 think, uh, mindset. <coughs> Performance is really the only thing that is keeping Pearl 6 from being used as a better Pearl 5. Well, prefer performance and CPAN. Well, performance and CPAN and the fact that we still need to write that Pearl 6 book. Well, and all that, and the basic stubbornness of human nature, yeah. and everything else. Uh, but I don't, and I don't think any of you are more stubborn than me. I, the last 25 years are proof of that. Anyway, if you don't like the version ordering, you can always work through it with the, uh, the reciprocals. Uh, I remember being amused when I learned that, that conductance is defined as the uh, inverse of resistance. They even just spelled the keyword backwards. That was cute. So you can do that with version numbers too. Uh, so in, in, in reciprocals, the ordering is reversed. Uh, or hey, let's, let's use Unicode. I like Unicode. <laughs> I don't know what that actually means. Maybe it means that Perl 6 is only one-sixth done while Perl 5 is already one-fifth done. Uh, theologically, you could take this to mean the first shall be last and the last first. Or maybe he who is to be the greatest among you must become the servant of all. It seems Jesus wasn't much into pecking orders. Or if we take seven as the number representing perfection, as it, as it tends to, we discover that uh, both versions of Perl are quite a bit less than perfect. Duh. Though I'm, I'm not sure you can use this to say that Perl is twice as imperfect as, as Perl. Perl 5 is twice as imperfect as Perl 6. It seems like one of those cases where 1 equals 2 for small values of 7. Uh, and in any case, I certainly don't believe that 5 plus epsilon is greater than 6. Uh, not even 5 plus moose is greater than 6. So please go back and read those 361 RFCs that started the Perl 6 process, and then tell me how many of those RFCs your notion of Perl 7 solves. You know, moose maybe addresses... <laughs> moose, moose addresses maybe 10, 10 or 20 of those RFCs. How about fixing some of those other problems too? That's what Perl 6 does. Look, I love Perl 5. I still use it heavily. It's my baby. But I also understand the warts of Perl 5. So let me make my, my position clear on this. Anything called Perl 7, with my blessing, had better do more than Perl 6 does to fix the problems of Perl 5. And I don't see that in any of the current proposals. And I don't see that any kind of simple-minded rebranding whether it's the Perl 7 or some other name, is going to fix the deep design issues that need to be fixed. And, you know, I really want Perl 7 to be better than both Perl 5 and Perl 6. I want it to suck, I want Perl 7 to suck differently than both Perl 5 and Perl 6. So, I don't know, maybe this inequality is just comparing runtimes, since 
Perl 6 runs slower than Perl 5. Someday we'll have Perl 7. It will run even slower than Perl 6. <laughs> of course, since Perl 7 will be the language heaven, uh, that won't matter much since we'll have all the time in the world. Uh, we're out of the world. I mean, I count. Uh, but maybe you shouldn't trust, trust my math on that subject since most of us Christians think that uh, 1 equals 3. <laughs> of course, the atheists think that 1 equals 0, so I guess they also have their, their computational issues to work out. Now, let me back up and clarify something. Uh, what I said earlier all sounds way too harsh, like I'm looking for a fight. I don't want to fight, because then I might win. <laughs> you know, that's the fourth step, isn't it? I don't want to win. Well, I don't want to win against you guys. I want to win with you guys. So let me put this naming thing in, in perspective. In terms of importance, names <coughs> and, and branding are at best a weak third place here. The technology comes in second place. The social structure of our community comes in a solid first place. That's what makes us special. Now, there are other languages that work in different ways. Ruby got Mindshare with some good t technology. Python gained Mindshare by getting Python institutionalized and by, I'm sorry to say, being more welcoming to newbies than Perl has been. JavaScript succeeded primarily by running on the right platform at the right time. But Perl is the shining example of the great open source community. In some ways, it's, it's the first great open source community. So maybe the zeroth most, most important thing to bear in mind is this whole idea of trying to do new things and sharing. This is not a new idea, not even with open source. This morning, my wife looked up from her uh, Bible reading that she has a schedule of and said, hey, this is for you. It's from Ecclesiastes. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Give portions to seven, yes to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there will it lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and in the evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. That kind of sums up the open source philosophy. While we're talking about the Bible, Gloria and I, we saw a painting just up the hill at St. Sophia's showing 24 chairs for the tribes of Israel plus the apostles of Jesus. Now, we all think that there were 12 tribes of Israel when in fact Joseph cheated and, we got two, and he got two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So really there were 13. And we also think that there were 12 apostles, but then, you know, Judas sort of disqualified himself. And we added Matthias and Paul, and so we ended up with 13 again. But despite being enlightened people, we can't actually bring ourselves to talk about 13 tribes or 13 apostles. It seems we are all still superstitious, even when we think we are not. And, you know, according to the psychologists, we're all very good at deluding ourselves especially about the fact that we are continually deluding ourselves. Or maybe you've seen the new Hobbit film. Uh, or, you, or you've read the book it's based on, loosely. In the Hobbit, we have the same problem. We have 13 dwarves, and that's just not lucky. Uh, we can't take one away because the dwarves come in matched sets. So, you know, we, we have to add a hobbit in, instead to make it 14. And a flaky wizard to make it 15, but he doesn't count. Or, or maybe he can't count. <laughs> maybe Tolkien should have just stuck with the original seven dwarfs. But, uh, anyway, back to Pearl. Well, Tol Tolkien and Pearl. 
Uh, it's been 13 years since we started Pearl 6, back in the year 2000. Now, just to aside, I, I very much recommend starting your software projects in the year 2000. It keeps the math simple. <laughs> but ever since the turn of the millennium, people keep asking when Pearl 6 will be production ready, whatever that means. Or they stop asking because it's been 13 years now. Obviously, it will never happen, they think. Uh, to these people, I would like to say, well, you know, maybe it can happen after all, if I am not deluding myself. The story goes like this. After Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, his publisher threw some mugs, figuratively speaking, and asked him for a sequel, thinking he would write something just like The Hobbit, only like a little newer. So, Tolkien started working on his new Hobbit, as it was called then. Well, actually spent a lot of time dithering over the 361 RFCs and did a certain amount of backtracking on the design based on the feedback from the implementers. Uh, year in and year out, well, they were called the Inklings. But yeah, he tended to throw out a chapter any time they criticized it. Uh, year in and year out, the publisher kept asking, is it production ready yet? And he kept muttering some lame joke about the new version being ready by Christmas. Well, we won't say which one, will we, precious? <laughs> what do you mean that wasn't how it happened? <laughs> so anyway, this went on for 13 years and still no book. But that's because it takes someone like Tolkien 14 years to write a sequel and get it published. And in that time, The New Hobbit has evolved into The Lord of the Rings. You may have heard of that book. I hear it's just a little bit hard to read, so they made a movie out of it. <laughs> uh, though that took a couple more years. And about $100 million. And a really stubborn director. So don't give up hope. The point of the story is not that we're going to make a blockbuster movie out of Pearl Six someday. Though if someone offers me $100 million, I might try. <laughs> you never know, I'm pretty stubborn. Uh, all other things being equal, I might succeed. But you know, the fact is, all other things are never equal, due to this thing called history. It's one of those inequality things again. We are all the result of a mixture of good history and bad history. We can't change that. But we have a choice. We can treat our history as a curse, or we can talk our history and turn it into a blessing for those around us. We always have that choice. I guess the point I really like to make here is that regardless of all the comparisons we like to do of our past mistakes or our past triumphs, we can't change them nor should we try. The future is always starting fresh, right now. And we don't really have a choice about that either. What we do get to choose is whether the future starts right here, right now. If that future is unevenly distributed, we can try to be one of the distribution points. That's what we've done as a community in the past, and we've ended up helping a lot of people. That's just not what we've done, it's who we are. There's more than one way to do things, but there's really only one, one way to be a Pearl community, and that way is love. Even though we don't know what we're doing, our method of improving the world is a kind of flooding algorithm, looking for ways forward, casting our bread on the surface of the flooding algorithm, as it were. But note there are many kinds of better. It doesn't have to be just one. There's more than one way to do it. You may have heard that before. So just pick one way to make things better and let other people pick other ways without looking down on them for it. That's how we've always done it. And that's how we'll keep doing it. In every way we can, the Pearl community keeps trying to invent that better future right here, right now. And then right here, right now. And then right here, right now. And whether I live for five more years or 50, when I'm dead and gone and can't say it anymore, you can keep on saying it for me. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. It's a pretty easy algorithm. Just keep inventing in the future till the world is a better place for more people. Even when you screw up or get hurt, and you will screw up and you will get hurt, Never use that as an excuse to stop, because the future can always begin again, right here, right now. Thank you. <laughs>